The new Omicron subvariant BA.5 has triggered a rise in infections in Portugal. But in many countries, the pandemic appears to be levelling off right now. What have we learned over the last two years? That's the question we'll be looking at in this week's COVID-19 special. How has the coronavirus impacted the education system in the Philippines? But first to Germany, where we look at the challenges faced by nurses and care workers. They bore the brunt of the pandemic. So have working conditions now improved? We hear from the staff themselves. A theatre piece called Really Sick, Who Cares? The performance rounded off a two-day meeting of Berlin's healthcare professionals. They're sick of the working conditions in Germany's capital. So these healthcare workers have got together with the unions to fight for better conditions for hospital staff. We haven't seen any improvement in our working conditions during the pandemic, and our jobs were already hard before it started. That shows that it's up to us to take the initiative. We need to improve our working conditions and the care we give our patients. The vitals aren't good. Hospitals here are chronically understaffed, leading to heavy workloads while wages remain low. That's due to budget cuts across the board in the healthcare system. Many of the cuts hit caregivers' paychecks and also affect the level of care that patients receive. Berlin's hospital protest movement was formed last year, spurred on by the nightly applause from the Berlin residents who were eager to support healthcare professionals and other key workers during the pandemic. Protesters argued that the government had even promised reform, but failed to deliver on those promises. With persistent strikes, the protest movement managed to negotiate a deal which, on paper at least, seemed to fulfill many of their demands. That was in the fall of last year. But hospital administrators have been slow to keep up their end of the bargain. For some, it's just all too much. We've lost six colleagues in the last three months because the new agreement just isn't being implemented. They said that was the last straw. They poured all their energy into making things better, but it hasn't happened. So they're done with their profession. The situation now is worse than before the strike. And it's worse still for healthcare workers that don't have the backing of a strong union like those providing in-home care or working in care homes for the elderly or disabled. Frédéric Vallon spent many years caring for the mentally disabled. During the pandemic, he wrote a book about the conditions in the home where he used to work, interviewing many of the workers there. A number of them have now also turned their backs on the profession. Caring for the residents one-on-one -on -one is hard work, and increasingly, that is what's coming up short. It's getting harder to find people willing to do the job. We have to look hard to find new caregivers, and many move on quickly because the pressure has gotten so high. New trainees need incentives to stay in the field for the long term. But that's where the problems begin. When you train someone, you first show them the ropes, then work with them, and then let them work on their own. These three steps that are essential in training are just not happening. It's still a hybrid of online courses and face-to-face -face training. And we've seen a wave of people quitting. Right after training, we're put to work on wards that are understaffed, and many burn out after a year or two. We spoke to one trainee who asked not to be identified for fear of reprisals. 
There aren't enough teachers and just not enough staff to guide us. We never get the training we need. Every time you go to a new ward, you have to figure it out all yourself. You're always afraid you'll make a mistake and harm a patient. It's emotionally stressful every time. Despite the difficult conditions, everyone here has gotten together to exchange ideas. They want to stay in their jobs and improve the healthcare system. They think the new union-backed agreement is an opportunity to do just that. Specifically, we need to have the right support for working in these delicate situations. Whether it's caring for people during birth or while facing serious illness or even death, we need supervision. I need to have the sense that I can live up to the expectations that people have of me. This is a great profession, and I know how important it is. It's important that I'm able to give adequate care to the people who put themselves in my hands. Berlin's healthcare workers are serving as a role model for the health sector nationwide. Right now, healthcare workers in Western Germany are on strike, and the activists think their message will continue to spread in the coming months. Okay, um... So how does the situation in Germany compare with the nursing profession elsewhere? Are nurses and care workers in other countries also pushed to the limit? DW's Mira Fricke spoke to Howard Katten. He's the CEO of the International Council of Nurses. We just learned about the situation of healthcare workers here in Germany, which unfortunately has not improved over the course of the pandemic. What is it like in, in other countries now? The pandemic has taken a huge toll on healthcare workers right the way around the world, both their physical and their mental health. And what we're now seeing is that that pressure is translating into nurses and healthcare workers quitting, resigning, leaving earlier than they would have otherwise have done. We went into this pandemic six million nurses short around the world. The work we've done, we think that that could be close to doubling that figure. One of the biggest issues here in Germany is to recruit new healthcare workers. Many don't see it as an attractive career. What has to be done to change that, not only in Germany, but on a global scale? We need to focus much more on how we retain the staff that we currently have. These are fairly simple, obvious things that we know about people feeling respected and valued at work, being recognised, being listened to, having good working conditions, fair pay, the equipment to do the job, being safe at work. Having enough staff is always a top issue for nurses to enable them then to deliver high quality care. Germany has, over the last few years, tried to attract people from abroad for the healthcare field. What do you think about those initiatives? Not just Germany. We have seen an increase uh, in recruitment from other countries, particularly from high income countries looking to recruit from low, low middle income countries. This is becoming a significant problem that's getting increased global attention because effectively what those high income countries are doing is that they're offloading the costs of educating their own workforce. Well, that means another country has paid for the education and then see those nurses recruited from them. And they are raising questions about shouldn't we be compensated by for this? Ultimately, this could potentially also leave those third countries with less sufficient workforce, right? We absolutely have seen, often the effects can be quite dramatic on the countries that lose their nurses and their health care workers. It might only be a small number of nurses and health workers, but they are coming from a country which already has fewer nurses per head of population. There's a great inequality in the distribution of nurses around the world, up to a tenfold difference in the ratios of nurses to head of population. So the impact can uh, be very severe in terms of being able to continue to provide health services, 
And also not forget that when your colleagues leave, that puts additional pressure on those that stay, meaning that they may then exit the workforce sooner than they otherwise would have done. Are there any countries that come to mind where you think they could be real role models for the rest of the world when it comes to welfare of healthcare workers? I think all countries could do more to have more nursing voices in top leadership positions so that politicians, policymakers making these big calls, these big decisions about the health of their country and global health, make sure that they are getting expert advice from the nursing profession, which is the largest section of our healthcare workforce. Healthcare workers around the world, 60 to 70% are nurses. You're not going to make strong health policy and have great health systems if you're not getting that nursing advice. Thank you very much for the interview and for your time, Howard. My pleasure. Thank you. This is what remote learning looks like for 17-year-old Raquel. Every day she hikes along the Tinipak River to collect the homework assignment papers. COVID numbers in this remote part of the Philippines, three hours east of Manila, are down. But her school, like most in the country, has remained closed for over two years now. With no internet connection, children in her village have no choice but to study alone. Some of my classmates would rather pick climbs and sell them to make money. Others ask friends to do their assignments. They didn't complete them anymore. Let's face it, they can't quickly earn money this way. Raquel saw many friends drop out of school during the pandemic. Some even got married. The Philippines have seen one of the toughest lockdowns for children worldwide. This public school in a poor suburb of Manila is ready to resume face-to-face -face classes the moment they get the green light. Director Cecilia Regala is deeply worried about the learning loss and the dropout rate. She says the longer children stay out of school, the less likely they will return. Most especially those who skipped class and don't comply with the requirements are poor. That's why I'm telling my my teachers not to engage too much on the outputs, on the, I mean, the completeness or completeness of the reports. Find ways and means, give them easy tasks so that they comply because their parents don't have salaries. The UN's children's organization had already demanded the government should prioritize the reopening of schools a task that is now up to Sarah Duterte, the freshly elected vice president and education minister, who will run the country at the side of Ferdinand Marcos Jr. Particularly in disadvantaged and poor communities like Raquel's village, children face an increased risk of exploitation. Raquel's father admits that with nine siblings, she has to help out in the house a lot. But as long as I earn enough money for us to survive, I want her to study. I want them all to study because that is what I did not do. Raquel has ambitious plans for the future. During the lockdown, she enjoyed helping other children in the village with their modules. So she decided to become a teacher. But first, she really hopes to graduate after attending in-person classes. The pandemic has also left its mark on young people in Germany. After more than two years of stress with COVID-19, now there's the war in Ukraine too. For youngsters suffering from depression, life is especially tough. 
we met with two young people who've learned to take an open approach about their illness, particularly in these times of crisis. The war in Ukraine has affected my depression and massively increased my fears. What if we were attacked? These fears just add to the thoughts already spinning around in my head. Then it all starts spinning even more. When I see these images of the war, I ask myself, why do I feel so bad? Others are doing much, much worse. And that triggers massive feelings of guilt, even though this illness isn't my fault. Then came a time of extreme suicidal thoughts. I was literally waking up every morning and my first thought was, I don't want to live anymore. And I went to bed thinking the same thing. You wake up in the morning and think, I could just stay in bed, because you don't have the motivation, you don't have the strength to get up. Or because you think, everything's crap now, anyway. My daily routine, of course, collapsed because of the coronavirus. I was practically just sitting on my couch thinking, oh great, now I've just moved to a new town and I hardly know anyone here. My only chance now is to lose myself in depression. For a time, I was consumed by fear. If, like me, you have an anxiety or panic disorder, you can totally develop a fear of infection. That then resulted in panic attacks and a big fear of dying. When I paint or draw, that always helps me to calm down. Even if I sometimes think that didn't turn out so well, but I know that the whole point of art is that it doesn't have to be perfect. I think nothing is more important than talking. Having someone who listens, who takes you seriously, that's a great, great help. By now I can sometimes joke about it, when part of me is feeling bad. Not necessarily a good joke, though. Kein guter Witz. It is a very common disease. No one should feel ashamed. And with every voice raised, one more person is talking about it. And maybe there'll be someone who hears my story and says, if he can do it, then so can I. Do you have any questions? DW's science correspondent Derek Williams has the answers and will keep you up to date with all the latest research on COVID-19. Send an email to covidproducer at dw.com. Today, he answers another question from a viewer. Since having COVID-19, it feels like I've had one infection after another caused by other bugs. Is there a connection? I've talked to a few people who believe that contracting COVID-19 made them more susceptible to other pathogens. Um, since recovering, they told me, they feel like they've been sick from other stuff, practically non-stop. Um, those reports are all anecdotal though, and, and rigorously checking the hypothesis of whether SARS-CoV-2 is also somehow to blame for post-COVID infections with other microbes, that would be a big challenge. Um, first and foremost, because it's obviously going to be difficult to distinguish between any post-COVID acquired illnesses and symptoms that might be caused by long COVID. Estimates differ, but a lot of studies have shown that somewhere between 10 and 30 percent of the people who had a bout of COVID-19 have recurring long COVID symptoms for weeks or maybe even for months afterwards. In other words, SARS-CoV-2 has done something to their bodies that makes them continue to feel lousy in some way. And figuring out exactly what's making them feel lousy whether it's the after effects of the COVID infection or maybe a new infection with something else entirely, 
that can be influenced by many factors. So many factors, in fact, that proving direct cause and effect would be really hard. Um, there are, however, some indications that, in some people at least, getting COVID-19 can affect the immune system in ways that likely make it harder to fight off other pathogens. For example, in a study published last October, researchers here in Germany looking at hospitalized patients discovered that in them, levels of key immune system cells known as dendritic cells dropped. They also found that the effect was long lasting and that the dendritic cells that were produced appeared to be functionally impaired. Now, dendritic cells spread the news about any recent invaders to the immune system's shock troops. So if they stop doing that effectively, as the study authors say, then it could have consequences for fighting off subsequent infections caused by other microbes. Um, in theory, then, at least, yes, having COVID-19 could make you more susceptible to other bugs later. But exactly how much would also be different from person to person. People on the Canary Island of La Palma are facing a double challenge. In the fall of last year, a major volcanic eruption devastated the island. Residents are still dealing with the consequences now and with the aftermath of the pandemic. A major volcanic eruption on La Palma in the Canaries, the first in 50 years on the island. Lava poured out of the Cumbra Vieja volcano for three months. Some 3,000 properties were destroyed, displacing 7,000 people. The estimated cost of reconstruction on the island is more than 840 million euros. And all this in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic. The hard work of reconstruction has begun. Over 900 workers have been employed just to clear up the volcanic ash. The public body entrusted to carry out the work by the governments of Spain and the Canary Islands is Gesplan. The most difficult thing was to see people totally shattered, seeing the psychological impact of losing their homes. I put myself in their place, saw the anxiety they're still suffering in the middle of a pandemic that's not yet over. It's still with us and will continue in the future. Farms and homes are slowly being salvaged. This house was covered up to its windows in ash. Visitors as well as locals come to see the devastation. In some places, the lava has solidified to create a wall 70 meters high. And it's spread out over three kilometers on its journey down to the sea. On one side is lush vegetation. On the other, lava cuts off a motorway covering entire neighborhoods, including a local health center, which had been vital during the height of the pandemic. The motorway itself is also blocked, extending journeys to the south of the island by an extra hour and a half. One resident told us how she struggled to cope with both COVID and the fallout from the volcano. I had COVID like half a year ago, during the time that the volcano, it was like combining two things after that, um, hard time of COVID, we had to be at home because it was a lot of sulfur, uh, there was no oxygen enough and a lot of ashes and it was so dangerous to get out. It was important of keep that security at home, that isolation, plus the noise of the volcano constantly, day and night. It was like a sound from the deep that it was po impossible to stop in our, in our brain, our head, it was so challenging. The island's health service, already in overdrive, having to deal with more than 11,000 cases of COVID-19 since its outbreak, also has to deal with health concerns posed by the volcanic eruption. Luckily, at the time of the eruption, La Palma had good epidemiological data. 
there were fewer COVID cases. As a result, we could allocate time of the epidemiological control of the people coming into the island, as well as residents who had contact with others or were even sharing living spaces. We concentrated on making sure people met our health measures. It is very difficult to tell people who have lost their homes, people who have had to move in with neighbors to wear a mask and comply with health measures in order to avoid infections. No one can say how long it will take for La Palma to fully recover. While COVID cases have decreased, the island is still on a high-risk alert, especially for people aged 60 and above. And although rebuilding work has begun, the immense amount of volcanic ash that has spread out over the island, in addition to the disruptions to working schedules due to COVID, has made rapid progress very difficult. That's all for this week. Stay healthy and see you next time.